Purple Heart Homes presents Putting the Pieces Back Together, a forum for veterans and the community to connect. Here are your hosts, veterans John Galena and Brad Borders. Howdy. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. After uh, after nearly a week in the office, uh, they're they're already ready to run me off. Oh yeah, it's yeah. yeah. There are a lot of a lot oh, of scuttlebutt. Wait a minute. You sound you. like you were a part of that team. Uh, no, I was just I was no? just witness and just I was, witness. Yeah, witness. Sure, and I sure. The chaplain's just a witness. <laughs> Likely right. excuse. He's probably behind the scenes pulling all the strings. Well, you know. No. Yes. He's not allowed to secretly, talk about things. Secretly <laughs> pulling the strings, like something out of a Dr. Zeus episode. So uh, yeah, I did tell uh, Tammy we were talking about some life planning. I told her that uh, you know when I go to the Great by and by, I want to be cremated. But uh, fortunately, she made the appointment for next Tuesday. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm you, you better be careful. Yeah. You better be really, really careful. We had a, I had a friend of mine, my, my first chaplain assistant, who we interviewed on this program, by the way, Dan Roberts. Um, his wife told him one time, she said, you know, we've got a lot of property out here, and I will find a place, and I'll put you in a shallow grave. And they'll so, never find you. And they'll never find that, you. That yeah, that's so scary. Yeah, yeah. She's a scary yeah. woman. She's I a mean, scary I'm woman. scared of her. Yeah, I'm scared of her, too. So. I, I have heard rumors and stories that there are some men that have went to Iraq to get away from their, uh, their better halves. Can't wait to get back over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey, I got a deployment I got to do, so. So, uh, hey, well, welcome to Putting the Pieces Back Together, uh, and we are glad you are with us this morning. Uh, this show is presented by Purple Heart Homes. We're a 501c3 based right here out of Statesville, North Carolina, but we do work nationally to help solve veterans' housing issues through safety and accessibility renovations, and then now we're constructing and manufacturing tiny homes to create space for veterans who are housing challenged, and um, we're really glad to be able to do that each and every day, and we're glad you're with us, and we have an awesome show uh, scheduled for today and a great guest and uh, man uh, this is going to be good it is going to be great i'm going to tell you you know this is our this is a really special guest this is our our first mr got homes on the show today mr that's mr. right mr yeah right. that's right that's right uh, chief warrant officer retired uh helicopter pilot i know and uh all around uh, extraordinaire worked for the state department and uh, the stories are going to be timeless uh they they are <laughs> they yeah, are absolutely and so we'll, we'll just uh, hope not to uh, crash and burn and uh, did make, you ever know, make his show terrible. did you ever know any warrant officers when you saw i did yeah? i did we we had a they couple. don't do they don't show up for anything <laughs> they, they, just, they just do oh. what they want to do when, right? when they do show up it's <laughs> seriously uh, probably that not good that's martin's true. like yep that's true <laughs> oh, yeah, it's <laughs> like hey uh, it's, it's like everybody else so like first sergeant comes out he's like all right we got formation zero four thirty tomorrow chief you're gonna be there nah man i'll see y'all about nine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i gotta get my coffee <laughs> <laughs> well they, they do show up when it's time to do their job right the, no they do their yeah. job extremely well they just it's like they're outside of the rules of the army I, it's like know, nobody nobody knows who's in charge of them i've always thought they were the ones that made the rules they, well, could be, yeah. but you wouldn't know. There was a, the CW5 at 3rd Special Forces Group when I was there. was a guy named Willie Sobat, and Willie was, he was an enigma. He was also an amateur philosopher, um, and he was a strategic genius, though. I mean, when I was in Germany with him, and I was asking him all these questions about what we were doing in Africa, and he, I sat for about two hours, and he explained to me, in layman's terms, what was going on and what was wrong in the world, right? <laughs> and he had all the problems solved by the end of the talk, right? And I was like, well, how do we make that happen? He was like, well, I don't know, but that's how you do it. So <laughs> he was a fantastic guy. So we're gr glad to have you here today, Martin. Well, thanks. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, so we got some uh, really good uh, questions here for us, but we want to get started kind of on what is your, what is your background? Where'd you come from and how'd you, uh, how'd you end up in the military? So I grew up in upstate New York at Plattsburgh Air Force Base, which was the last base my dad was stationed at. Ah. So we all grew up there. And then uh, after high school, uh, I went in the Air Force. My twin brother and a couple friends went in the Marine Corps. And uh, once I saw their experience, I immediately went to the Air Force. Yeah, absolutely. You were the smart one. <laughs> I really was. Right? Yeah. Well, we're going to find out how smart here just in a few minutes, because I don't know if going from the Air Force to the Army is the smartest choice, but we'll figure that out along the way. Possibly not. Yeah. Oh what did you do in the Air Force? What was your job there? Avionics guy. So I worked okay. on all the cargo in, in MAC, Military Lift Command. So 141s, yeah. C-130s, C-5s. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I loved it. Yeah. And just could have easily been a career Air Force guy. 
But I thought, you know, I better get out and get to college. Because yeah. when I got out of high school, I was like, I'm never going to college. Yeah. Mm. So did that. And then while I was in college, an opportunity opened up for me to transfer over to the Army Reserves and go to flight school. And I was like, ah, oh, this is great. So yeah. went to flight school and came back to Massachusetts. I was flying Hueys at Fort Devens. The Huey is an awesome aircraft. It's, it's just the Huey. Yeah. I, I compare it like going from a Huey to a Blackhawk is like going from a Volkswagen Bug, which you love, no radiator, you can work yeah. on it. You love flying or driving it. And then you go to a Porsche, right. which is the Blackhawk, and, right. and it's amazing. So loved my time in the Hueys. Once I finished college, I had like a total of 280 hours in Hueys. So I'm sending out my resumes going, okay, I want a flying job here, flying job there. And they're like, yeah, call us back when you got 3,000 hours. I said, well, that'll be about 20 years from now in the reserves. <laughs> right. So uh, I just said, well, what's my backup plan? So I took the LSAT, did okay, and shotgunned a bunch of New England law schools. And then I was like, let me pick one in the Mid-South. And I literally just picked Wake Forest out of a catalog. Yeah. And uh, somehow they accepted me. Somehow. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I drove my little 79 Celica down here and went to law school. And then I went in the inactive reserves and I thought, you know, my fly days are probably done. I don't know. Third year law school, I went down to the unit in Salisbury. Yeah. And there was still a bunch of, they were all Hueys, a bunch of old Vietnam vets, which is the way the reserves and guard were. And they were like, yeah, yeah, don't call us, we'll call you. So left private practice, came over to uh, Statesville in 95 as a prosecutor, and it was exciting. Ended up prosecuting a case where I met a, a trooper who was in this unit. Hmm. Then he introduced me to a couple of people. Next thing you know, so this is 99 now, nine years in the inactive reserves, and boom, I'm in the unit. Down to the Blackhawk transition course at Fort Rucker, formerly Fort Rucker. And uh, so I flew in the guard from Salisbury from 99 until I retired in 2017. No kidding. And absolutely loved it. I yeah. love flying the Blackhawk. What an amazing helicopter. So the, uh, the Huey, um, I had a friend of mine, another friend of mine who's a Blackhawk guy. And, and uh, he was talking about the Huey and how there's a nut that's on top of the aircraft, on top of the rotors, and they call it the Jesus nut. Jesus nut because if it comes off, your blades are gone. Yeah, that's right. That's where you're going you to see You get blue blades, one blue east, right. one blue west. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's actually his nickname, Jesus nut, right? That's what we call him. So, yeah. Everybody's like, is he a nut for Jesus? Nah, it's, it's a thing on a helicopter. I mean, he, he, he's, he loves Jesus too, yeah. but... Uh, but that was the, the name was from the, the Marines from the still Huey. flying Hueys. They just they didn't want to go to the Blackhawk. They're the only ones that didn't because they were so desperate to get the Osprey finally fielded. Right. If they'd gone to the Blackhawk, they probably might have the Osprey funding might have been cut. It took a long time to get it uh, fielded. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. The other the first time I saw one was in Iraq, and I didn't. I thought it was a UFO when I saw it. So if it, for those who are listening, to Osprey is a very weird aircraft, and it's a hybrid. It, it can go from like a like a twin engine airplane turboprop. Yeah, to a helicopter, the thing, the the the, the rotors the they rotate. Yeah, yeah. the hole in the cells, so the blades are now up in the air rather than right. forward. Yeah. It, yeah, it's so. crazy. It's like something out of Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, very technical. Have complex. any of you ever flown on one? No, I have not. I, I have not either. No, they're very yeah. fast. I, I have yeah. also not flown as the single marine on the show. So <laughs> 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 I was I was pretty scared because they when they were testing them there was a. There was a lot of crashes to begin with. There it was, were. It was. Yeah. It was scary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There were. I did not want to. Did you spend time on a helicopter at all? Uh, when yeah. I mean, vehicle? I've been I've been on a Huey a few times, but uh, my my job did not, you know, require me to be on a on a helicopter very often. Yeah. Now Paul yeah. spent a lot of time in in Hueys. In, Paul in his time. Paul, Paul Cochran. Cochran. Yeah. yeah. In Hueys. Yeah. In Hueys. No kidding. Yeah. 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 Which Paul also rode in jeeps. That was. Prior yeah, to Humvees. Like a Willis. Like a Willis <laughs> Jeep. Yeah. yeah, with a gas can. I don't know what can. that says about gas him. gas can but, on the front. Uh, yeah. Browning rifle right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It says he's old. That's what it says. He is, he's got that condition called uh, too many birthdays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this will be another reason he'll be ready for me to go back out on the road. And That's the radio exactly show. right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So. That's cool. Yeah. So as a as a pilot in the military, you had some unique perspective, and certainly as a warrant officer, you know, as uh, we alluded to earlier, kind of stand outside the ranks, and you know, this idea of of 
you know, not calling you sir or not calling you necessarily, uh, you know, chief warrant officer. You know, a lot of people use the nickname chief, but a lot of people truly do say mister, right? Which, yeah, it's, it's kind of the civilian equivalent, so it's a little confusing. But it's also yeah. denotes some professionalism, right? There's, there's a, a different level and different standard in the warrant officer ranks. And so I'm just curious, how did, what was your perception, you know, as a pilot, uh, you know, carrying troops to and from? And, and the work that you did, what was your perspective of, of the military and, and how might that differ? So the beautiful part about it being a warrant officer is you don't take command. You're not a platoon company commander like the lieutenants, captains, majors. You are a technical specialist. That's the description of a warrant officer. So all you do is get really good at what you do, which is what I did. I mm-hmm. became one of their senior instructor pilots. I went to the maintenance test pilot course. All you do is fly. So when you're in the cockpit, whether you're flying with a full board colonel, you're the, the, the one who's controlling what goes on in that aircraft. Uh, so I didn't have to do all the peripheral things, if you will, in the military. My job is to fly helicopters and do a, a darn good job at it. Mm-hmm. So uh, love doing it. And, and I was able to do it my whole career, where a lot of the majors, you get into you know, commands and stuff where you're not doing what you originally did, even flying-wise. Um, you end up flying a desk at some point. Not so, but we're an officer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right up until the last week I was there, I was, I was still flying. Yeah. So one of, one of the things, you know, we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday, and um, one of the parts of this show is kind of the reintegration aspect, right, and what it's like for veterans to reintegrate. And we all have different experiences based on uh, not only where we're from and, and not only what type of military unit we were in and what type of career but in so many cases, uh, whether we are coming from active duty or the reserves and, um, you know, both have different experiences, right? Sure. And so you, you have both, right? You, mm-hmm. you not only deployed in, in the sense to uh, your training in the Air Force and then returning off of active duty, but then you uh, deployed while in the reserves as a pilot into a combat zone and returned, and then again as a civilian with the State Department and coming back. And so what were some of the contrasting differences that that you had during those uh, reintegration periods? So, you know, in the Air Force, I served overseas, but obviously it wasn't during a time of combat. So you get out, and it's four and a half years, and you kind of miss it because it was full-time camaraderie. Then when you go into the reserves, unless you're a full-time person at the unit, which they have some of those, you're truly what they call an M-Day soldier. You have a regular civilian job that you do, and then I was called it my second full-time job. Because pre-9-11, when I was up at Fort Devens, you talk about warrant officers running the show. This is not Devil Dog Devens Base, (laughs) just to be clear for everybody. Fort Devens, (laughs) Army Base, (laughs) up in Massachusetts. Not named after Devin Alexander. Yeah, it's not not Devin. They they renamed the base. I just want to make that very clear. (laughs) They wanted to make them inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So when I was at Fort Devens, warrant officers rolled in, signed in, and right to Tiny's Breakfast. Mm. You know, it was truly just a, a flying club, honestly. And then once I came down here, got in the guard, things were more serious. Training was a lot more serious, night vision goggle training. Then post 9-11, the whole character of the Guard and Reserve changed. Yeah, it changed. All of a sudden now you're flying all the time. As much as active duty, your requirements, minimum flight hours were the same as active duty pilots. Flying all the time, then all of a sudden now the teams start coming in and modding your aircraft, right? They're putting these systems on your aircraft, which gives you the idea we're probably going to get. Mm-hmm. A warning order says get ready to deploy to combat in the next year. Mm-hmm. So that happened in, in 04, and we deployed for the first time in 05. And, and to get back to your question, when you get back, you've left your civilian job. Um, and depending on what type of job you had, whether you're like a state or federal employee, it's just waiting for you. But if you had a regular job that, and you were the person that did it, you were gone for a year and come back, and it's tough. Mm-hmm. And then your family's changed because you're gone for a year. That's right. Uh, so there were a lot of pressures on people. And I hate to pay, say lip service, but it almost was. You come back and they, they give you this little speech at Fort Bragg. Yeah. And yeah. hey, you know, welcome back. And by the way, if, if you go to the VA, um, you know, you want any benefits, don't take a shower, look a little disheveled. Not, not, not. Yeah, yeah, right. Honestly, yes. and, and I found that personally insulting. Yeah, you know, right. I was, I was like, wondering why it smelled yeah. there. I didn't yeah. get that memo. <laughs> that literally was the advice the guy gave. Yeah. Hey, we're, well, we're coming up on a break, uh, yeah. and uh, we'll be back. You're listening to Putting the Pieces Back Together, and our guest today, Martin Gottel. And uh, it's going to be a great uh, rest of our show. He's telling us some cool stories. So we'll see you in three minutes. 
All right, we are back live with you here on Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. And we have uh, got special guest with us today, Martin Gotthold. And uh, we are just excited to be hearing his stories. And uh, we're going to get back to uh, the learning about his reintegration uh, here in just a moment. But uh, before then, we've uh, got to let Devil Dog Devin uh, give us the Project of the Week update. Before he uses uh, his morning voice, too. I'm my sure. morning voice. I sure yeah. hope he uses his morning voice. <laughs> <laughs> He's still in training. I do. <laughs> it's a good thing we have volume now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Mm-hmm. That uh, you know, I, I can just be my normal voice, and the only ones that are impacted are you guys here in the studio. That is so. true. That is true. <laughs> uh, so, but before we get started, I'm a little nervous. Um, Martin's my lawyer, so I just want to know if I'm being billed for this time, right? Uh, <laughs> <Could be. laughs> No, we if, had a great plea deal. Your ankle monitoring bracelet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fifty whoa, feet whoa, from schools. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We got it all worked out, don't we? I thought that was attorney-client privilege right there. <laughs> yeah, good oh, thing. Man. I thought you waved it. Yeah, good thing I, Darren I Campbell showed up. There was a reason he was never allowed to leave the office between the hours of nine and five. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's kind of odd that he always eats lunch there. It's kind of kind of weird. It's a good thing that Darren Campbell shows not next. Oh even. yeah, no kidding. So man. It, it must have aided that the property's fenced in with barbed wire <laughs> on top. <laughs> uh, so moving. Moving on to the project of the week. Uh, <laughs> um, so, hey, this week we've got a project from, from here in North Carolina, Wilson, North Carolina, too far away. Um, Specialist Holly. He, he was, uh, he served during, from 81 to 89, and just like a, a lot of veterans, um, we we often think that oh veterans got injured in combat and and uh, they they went to war and well there's so many times where there's peace times and the veterans still have to train that that's something that we don't recognize very often and uh, Mr. The Specialist Holly I almost said Mister he was not a warrant officer but uh, Specialist Holly there he he got injured in training just like a lot of veterans do mm-hmm. and so it makes things difficult to get a get around and, and do work around his house and. Uh, his roof was leaking uh, in several places, going to cave in, um, had bad floors from leaking roofs because that's something that always happens from, from roofs is if you let them go too long, they cause other problems in their home. And so uh, he he reached out to Purple Heart Homes, another veterans organization, told us about told him about us, and he applied through the process. And Tammy Burchett, she is such a great project manager. Um, she she did everything she could, and, and um, he told me the other day on the phone, he says, yeah, my wife was, she, she, she kept telling me to do something about that roof. He said, I think y'all saved my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> There you so, go. She so, didn't make a cremation appointment for him. So that's she good. did not make yeah. a cremation report uh, yeah, yeah. appointment for him. No, no, that's no, good. no, no. Uh, yeah. So, so Purple Heart Homes is not just impacting veterans by uh, by helping them with housing needs, but we're saving marriages. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's a new tagline. <laughs> That's Saving marriages <laughs> one home at a time. One home at a time. Okay. And 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 just briefly, I want to mention that in a few weeks, we're going up to Rhinelander, Wisconsin. I'm Rhinelander. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, um, I, they, I, they don't talk like that. Um, but <laughs> we're going to help an Air Force you know, veteran. You, your mission when you get up there is, is to get everybody to do that. Do, to, do you get want it me on to get video on the... for your TikTok thing, that little uh-huh. social media thing you've got, and everyone going, welcome to Rhinelander. Yeah, I'll, I think I'll, we've I'll... created a TikTok monster. <laughs> I mean, when people are messaging us asking where Devil Dog Devin's at and why he hasn't put out a TikTok today. Uh, oh, my gosh. Joe Baker, <laughs> Joe Baker sent me a message this morning. If everybody knows Joe Baker, Joe Baker Fitness, uh, yeah, shameless plug for Joe Baker Fitness. But um, he wanted to know where the – he didn't call him Devin or Devil Dog. He says, where's the TikTok guy from the PHA? TikTok guy. What happened to him? What happened well, to the TikTok guy? Well, they're not liking and subscribing enough, I guess. I I didn't think it was that that little subscribe button and that bell icon. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. 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 So So in case you don't know, Devin has an awesome TikTok page and you can go watch him do silly things on TikTok. Not not only silly things, typical Marine things like eating crayons. He does. He actually eats a crayon on TikTok. It is is the proof that we've always needed to. No crayons uh, were hurt in that. We're going to jack (laughs) jack your subscribers up by at least 12 today. (laughs) Baby. Devil dog Devin at TikTok. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. All right. So let's let's get back to some uh, real stories here <laughs> and uh, things that are things that are more interesting than watching Marines eat crayons. Yeah, that's right. uh, so, Martin, uh, you were telling us before our break a little bit about the transition that you had went through coming off of active duty, having uh, been overseas, uh, stationed overseas, and then and coming back to civilian life. Uh, but then you you joined the reserves, the Army reserves, I'll say, and uh, and with that you ultimately did uh, two deployments into Iraq. And so tell yeah. us what what that was like, and and more of what that experience in reintegration was like. So yeah, in, in the guard here in North Carolina. Then, so then I'm flying Blackhawks, and uh, and after uh, I, I flew for Baptist Hospital for about a year and a half, rather than practice law, because I knew the deployment was coming up. And that allowed me to go to a few schools. So we got deployed in 05, uh, went over to uh, just north of Baghdad in Balad, came back. And for a lot of people that had given up jobs, it, it was tough. It was tough for the guys in our unit to some of the guys that weren't full-timers. Um, I took almost a year off mm -hmm. and rebuilt my little house that I had um, before I finally started. You know, maybe it's time to having the luxury of let me just open a law firm. Mm -hmm. So I started a law practice. And then all of a sudden, 2011, they're like, okay, here comes your second deployment. So I was like, now I've got two paralegals, got a fairly decent law practice going. I'm going to have to shut it down. So I found a couple guys, said, hey, you want to join forces? You keep my law practice going on my end. And when I get uh, back in 2011, I'll just come right back in. Mm -hmm. So that worked for me. It, it didn't for, for some guys, right? I mean, it was tough. So you were, I mean, at one point, you, you, you became a judge. Right, right, yeah. And what, what years was that? So that was 98 to 2002. Okay, yeah. And then, uh, so I got in the in the guard down here in 99 Yeah. after a nine-year hiatus. In the was that army. district court or superior court? District. Okay. District court judge, four-year terms. Got it. And uh, I came in second place in my area election bid. And uh, so then I was like, hmm, yeah. am I going to start practicing law now? Because I was private practice, prosecutor, judge. I said, no, we're going to get deployed. So I flew for Baptist Hospital for about a year Got and it. Half. And so you said you did um, you did some work for the State Department as a pilot as well. Was that was that a Black Hawk uh, flying that, or do they no, do some in, other? Interestingly aspect? enough, so I get back in 2011 from my second deployment where we closed down Iraq and mm -hmm. safe, successful, sovereign, stable country. You know, Joe Biden came over and gave a spiel, and uh, and then I missed flying, quite frankly. And I'd yeah. met some guys over in Iraq that were uh, civilian contractors, and a friend of mine who was a former Marine. Uh, who's flying Blackhawks with us, he got into a State Department gig because the State Department needed helicopters. Well, the Marines fielded the Osprey, and they got rid of their old CH-46s, which looks, it's a Vietnam version of the Chinook, the only yeah. other tandem rotor. So the State Department had all these helicopters that they got for free from the Marine Corps, but then they realized that they needed to hire a bunch of former Marines to fly them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything about the State Department's aviation wing, which a lot of people don't know about, they have a big aviation asset, was Army. Everything about nine corps, the civilian contractor was army. Yeah. So when they brought all these Marines in, total culture clash. Yeah. Marines are different. So they said, you <laughs> know what? Short bus different. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. So in the army, we use checklists. You know, you start up things. You actually yeah. go check. So the Marines come in there. They hire them. They're just starting things up. Yeah. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. So they said, we need to probably bring a few army guys in. So I was one of those army guys. Not you were keep out. the Marines in check. Well, they wanted to mix it up a little okay. bit. Okay. So uh, temper things a bit. So they sent me down to Patrick Air Force Base, and a couple of Marines taught me how to fly that thing. And it's a beast. Yeah. So next thing, I'm in Kabul, Afghanistan, flying with, there were about 26 pilots. Three of us were prior army. All the rest were Marines. And an impressive group. A lot of HMX mm -hmm. guys that they flew the presidential flying. That's HMX, Marine mm -hmm. Squadron. So uh, it was great flying over in Afghanistan in 2014. I spent a lot of time on the Chinook, and the one thing that just horrified me about getting on that aircraft is the crew chief would be walking through with like a rag, and there's a, a million Please. miles of hydraulic tubing right. piping throughout yeah. that, the fuselage yeah. of that aircraft. And the, and the crew chief is like got this rag and checking joints and going, looking at the rag, and I'm like, hey, man. <laughs> If that thing's leaking, are we in trouble? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and the Chinook's a new version, if you will, of the tandem. The old CH-46 is a Vietnam era. Yeah. The Marines. Right. So, uh, yeah, the State Department flew those. That had a steam engine in it. Pretty close. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> Shovel the coal. It was the first time where I actually had to consider how much. I could, in the Blackhawk, you just land around 130 degrees. 
full load of troops, fill it up. Doesn't matter. Right. They fill it up and you take off because it's a beast. That thing, you, you couldn't, only so much fuel, you had to really consider your weight. And right. of course, Kabul's pretty high up altitude wise. Sure. So, uh, but that was a neat gig. And I, see, I kind of miss flying. I get back in 2011, I'm practicing <laughs> on. It's, it's, you know, it's not like flying in a combat zone. Right. So I told my partners, hey, I'm going to leave for another year, a couple, you know, a year later. And they're like, what? And so I went over and did that for a year. And absolutely loved it. I mean, so, it was, Martin, share a funny story with us about your your time, you know, deployed downrange. What what was what was it like? What's something that stands out in your mind that was that was humorous that that kept you sane, so to speak? So, the first deployment, oh five, things were still a little tricky in, in Iraq. Second deployment, and it was kind of fascinating because they split our company off from our battalion and said, "You got a special job. You're going to take over from Alaska." And you're going to fly the three high-ranking generals in the country around. So my company commander had to pick three instructor pilots to fly F1, F2, F3. And F1 was the four-star commanding general of the U.S. forces in Iraq, who at that time was Lloyd Austin. Oh, yeah. Presently our secretary of defense. So he paired me, and, and it was, I was, you know, with him. So we flew Lloyd Austin around. So I get to Iraq. We went on the advance team, me, a, a lieutenant, and, and another pilot. And I'm meeting with the uh, Alaska guys because we're going to take over the, the, the mission. So I come in, and I'm a, I'm a W-2. Well, the guy that had my job flying Lloyd Austin around was W-5. Right. He was the command warrant officer of the Alaska Guard. Right. So I walk in, and I'm like, yeah, I'm here to rip with you guys and explain. They look at me like, well, you're yeah. going to be the one flying yeah. Lloyd Austin. His I'm, security team's there, you know, and they're interviewing me, honestly, too. Right. And, and it was pretty funny. So I, the Alaska group is an interesting bunch. Because I go to this command war officer's trailer. He had half a trailer. They got a movie screen, a projector, a popcorn maker. They, they got booze everywhere. <laughs> right, right. And I'm like, because that's rule, violation of rule one. When yep. you get in theater, no yep. booze. Never. And, never happened. I never saw one. So next thing I know, they've got this. <laughs> they've got this captain teaching me how to make wine. <laughs> so you go get three cases of juice from the defect. We don't call them chow halls anymore. Dining facility. And these Alaska guys were getting these big packets of yeast mailed to them. <laughs> so they're rip, rip, teaching me, and I thought this is kind of strange. He showed me how to clean out the five big five-gallon jerry can that hadn't right. been used for gas. Yeah, you got to use a little Clorox. You don't want any, you know, and clean it all out. Then you pour the juice. And as, you, as you're pouring, add the yeast. And then they had this, this trailer that wasn't used. So you would leave it in that trailer, right? <laughs> so plausible deniability if somebody finds it. And you check on it from now on then. Right. And the jerry can would start to swell as the yeast <laughs> would So you'd let off a little pressure. <laughs> right. And then, you'd, you know, they had those big water bottles. Uh -huh. So when it was ready, you'd pour it into the water bottles. Then you'd let it set. And all the sediment would float. Then you'd pour it to another water bottle. Pretty soon, you had a really good batch of wine. <laughs> now, this, this just know. gave me a whole new perspective on the professionalism I of Warren Off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So, a lot of skills. I mean, boy, we are. So, was this for like uh, in-flight service wine? Yeah, that's while right. you were flying yeah. the general, 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 you ready oh, for it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> did you get some cheese and crackers yeah. with that wine in your flight? <laughs> like, hey, sir, put your tray table down. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I'm retired now, so I don't think it's going to affect any OERs, and I'm not going to get any more for my benefit. But Alaska was a wild group to uh, to replace. Yeah. So, but yeah. So for so 2011, I just flew Lloyd Austin around, and it was all he went really for was from Baghdad to the U.S. Embassy in the Green Zone to have dinner. With so the US uh, ambassador yeah. every night. Really, really interesting. I'm just partly curious. Uh, we had uh, while doing a, a, a patrol through Samara, our uh, patrol team had gotten hit, and there was a, happened to be a general flying over, and. He had his pilot set him down and go back and and actually carried off some of our wounded hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, took them to the to the medevac site and just where we were at. I mean, it was just a a really tough spot to have any type of signal. If it had not been for for them seeing us, then you know we'd have had a whole mm -hmm. different kind of situation because we didn't have any comms at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, did you have experiences like that where, as you're flying, you are seeing? you know, different parts of battles and things happening. How did that work? So in, in 05, because 11, I'm just flying Austin around, and he wasn't going outside the wire very much, honestly. Um, in 05, yes. We were flew all the FOBs. Yep. And when we got there in 05, they said, listen, you're going to fly in the MEF sector, the Marine Expeditionary Forces. So every day we took off out of Balad, 
we circumvented Baghdad and went to all these different fobs flying around. And you'd be flying along, see an explosion, and you'd be like, holy cow. Mm-hmm. We weren't Medivoc Blackhawks because they were specifically yeah. designated. But we'd be flying around. And I used to say, listen, if we get shot out, I'll make the determination. Do we turn around and engage or do we just keep on going? Mm-hmm. We had 240s, right? An improved version of the, the M60, same ammo. And the first time we had an RPG just miss us, we were three clicks away. And then I realized I changed my briefing. Our, our guns were just defensive. Once we got shot at, boom, we just kept trucking. Because we if you returned, you you don't know what you're going to find. Yeah. Right. So You might get shot at again. Yeah, you might go right chance, into a whole actually. hornet's nest with yeah, small right. arms and RPGs. <laughs> uh, so... But I never actually saw or got called in to any scenes where we had to do exactly mm-hmm. that. That was for the medevac guys. I, just thinking about, you know, I never met that particular general, but just thinking about uh, the impact that that had, right? And yeah. we just, we, he happened to be close enough to a base where he could be dropped off and mm-hmm. sent, you know, sent his uh, helicopter back and, yeah. and just, you know, life-saving decision. You know, yeah. it's just those yeah. types of split-second decisions that – you know, people make and, and just thinking through, you know, you being the pilot is your aircraft, not the generals. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, right. and and to think of how some, you know, teams work and what they're willing to do is just really amazing. And so uh, well, I look forward to uh, the next half of the show here. Uh, we're getting ready to take a break and want to hear more about the work that you're currently doing as a, as a lawyer. Want to hear uh, some about your uh, work as a judge, uh, just a lifetime of service to try and unpack in a, in a little bit of an hour. So uh, we appreciate you being on the show. But you're listening to Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. We will be back in just a few moments after a break. All right, we are back live with you of Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. Uh, what a great show. Uh, again, uh, just sitting here with uh, Martin Gahome, retired chief warrant officer and uh, judge. past lawyer. Superior court judge, yeah. lawyer, district court judge, district court judge. Yeah. pilot. Uh, I'm telling you, what a, what a career of service. Yeah, and, uh, for we sure. Just, Really appreciate you and uh, what you do for our community. And so we'd like to just unpack a little bit about uh, you ran a campaign, you you become a district court judge, uh, you, you've, another thing we haven't even talked about, you got your civilian fixed wing pilot's license, and uh, and then now you've been a prosecutor and you've, you're back to private practice. I'm, I bet he sings, yeah. too. He probably sings and, <laughs> yeah. and, and plays. You want to bring your plays. ukulele in here with yeah, him? Yeah, I don't have a ukulele. I have a dulcimer, so dulcimer, back whatever. up, back up. Yeah. When you say that, I, I oh, took look a, at me. I'm John. I'm a music expert. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I sing to my kids and they go running from the room. So I got, I've got a song. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, so when in your time um, as a lawyer um, and as a judge, did you ever encounter veterans coming through the justice system? Mm. Yes, but none that particularly stick out to me like you're a veteran and that's part of the reason. I, sometimes guys would show up in uniform yeah. Um, and if I could cut them a break, even as prosecutor or certainly as, as a lawyer, uh, I would. But I, I never ran into anything that um, was kind of veteran related. Yeah. Um, except for one of the guys in my unit, honestly. Um, but now, interestingly that you say that, they've recently formed these veterans courts. In, mm-hmm. in, in Statesville, they're looking for somebody to help run that, uh, where the, the prosecutors, the DAs, will see that you're a veteran, and then they'll, they'll send you to this veterans court, and they yep. provide a little extra assistance for you. Because um, a lot of issues are, are difficult to detect. It's not. I was talking to a VA rep in Rowan County, great guy. He's like, you know, it's not Sylvester Stallone curled up in a ball screaming. It's there are a lot of issues that may be difficult to detect or necessarily relate to to your service. So, um, if you're a veteran and you find yourself uh, in, you know, rolled up in the criminal side of things, criminal court, uh, they have now a special program for veterans. Yeah, which uh, yeah, the Idaho County got a grant uh, last year and um, from uh, the Department of Justice and, and Justice for Vets, and uh, so. Um, that program is going to get started here um, in about uh, probably four months. It'll be up and rolling. Uh, the court will happen uh, twice a month. Um, and uh, veterans that, that are, you know, entangled with the justice system will have, if, if their offenses are connected with 
mental health issues or substance abuse, they'll have the opportunity mm -hmm. to voluntarily get into that program. Um, and it's a one to two year process, which coalesces all of the county's resources um, with regarding those things. It's a team approach with the DA's office, um, you know, court appointed uh, defense attorneys, the judge, um, probation, clerk of court, right? All, all sure. of these, all the of these folks. And then also too, um, mental health, um, VA, um, you know, and then, and then a, a, a mentoring uh, program that is in conjunction with that where there are veterans that are uh, doing well that will pair up with these folks that have um, you know are having a bad time and and uh, headed down the wrong path and um, we're really excited about uh, seeing that come to fruition the training is going to begin second week of july so the uh, folks from dc are coming down to train our team uh, and then probably three months after that the, the first court will be held and so we're really excited about that and so yeah, um, I'm welcoming you to get involved. Huh. Um, <laughs> one of the one of the interesting things that I find about this process, and I've been uh, talking about this to some of our partners at Habitat for Humanity International. Uh, so many veterans that have experienced, particularly experienced combat, but have received a dishonorable discharge, mm -hmm. it's now being reviewed as to how their combat experience and post-traumatic stress was undiagnosed until mm -hmm. after they got out of the service yeah. and they were in the VA. Yeah. And so consequently, some of them got in trouble coming home. Maybe they had some time left in their, in their contract. They, they experienced combat, they had post-traumatic stress, maybe they got into a, a, a tussle with their, with their commander, or maybe they, maybe they started drinking and got a DWI, and then they got a dishonorable discharge, and just how quickly you can spiral down and mm -hmm. find yourself in the criminal court system while really it's all connected to that experience that, that got diagnosed late, right? Mm -hmm. was, or if the, it's diagnosed at all. Uh, that's right. exactly right. And the, yep. so the process by which you exit the military can have an impact into how you reintegrate, right? And, and whether or not you find yourself on, on the right side of the law or the wrong side. Because the civilian, um, you know, in my opinion, the civilian community does not understand how to properly reintegrate and accept back in those that, that have experienced yeah, and combat. I, and I think, too, in Martin, you may be able to speak to this, but we have a we have a lot of we have a lot of veteran law enforcement officers, uh, you know, within our county that mm -hmm. that you know they've got their finger on the pulse of how veterans are doing, and um, you know, inevitably, you know, they're you know the stats are pretty clear from the VA. It's like six or seven percent of all veterans across the country are somehow entangled with the justice system. So, county as large as you know, Idaho County with one hundred and you know, 10, 120,000 people in it now, we probably have, you know, eight, 900 veterans that are, that are, you know, facing charges and, or, or in the jail right now. And I think last year when we did our study on, um, how many veterans are currently at the detention center, I think it was like 17 veterans at the detention center currently that, and the charges range from all the way to the, you know, the most you know, really bad felonies all the way down to, you know, a couple of DWIs, that kind of thing. And so uh, mm -hmm. we recognize that there's a real need um, and that the history of Veteran Treatment Court is um, is pretty positive as far as rate of recidivism. That um, it's very few veterans that graduate the program that are ever back before a judge. And, and so we're really excited about what that's going to do for our county. And So, um, Martin, just uh, kind of take us more to the general side of, of the conversation. Um, in, in our conversation preparing for the show, uh, we talked a little bit about some of the value that you found in being a judge and, and some, you know, how you felt you could have a positive impact. Would you share some of that with, with the listeners? I think too often they, they feel like, you know, particularly judges and prosecutors are, uh, they're just mean cold-hearted people that aren't doing any good in the community, but I really see something different in, in how you perceive it and like to share that with the listeners. Well, certainly as a prosecutor, and I, I was actually on this show with Pat Shannon in 2002 during mm -hmm. the re-election campaign, okay. and I remember a caller calling and asking me a question, and my answer to her was, in a lot of respects, prosecutors have a lot more power than the judges, mm -hmm. because when you are a prosecutor, and that's why it helps 
to have maybe a, a background in practicing law outside just being a prosecutor at a law school mm. is you have an inordinate amount of discretion, discretion in plea agreements and what you do. And not everyone deserves to have the, the, the sort of justice wielded on them, you know, like a hammer. Some people really deserve breaks and you take into account mm -hmm. maybe they're a veteran uh, and other people just don't, right? So that's what you do as a prosecutor. So you can really help people and really help with victims. I mean, I'd, I'd still remember some cases I had as a prosecutor um, where the victims were so grateful that I zealously prosecuted the case on their behalf. And then when you get to be a judge, especially in the district court judge, a lot of it's family stuff, a lot of yeah. it's juvenile court stuff, where much like the veterans, you see that if they just had some safety mechanisms in place, yeah. they wouldn't have gotten below that line of acceptable parenting mm -hmm. and had to have the Department of Social Services come in, for instance, Correct. and put the, the children in foster care or with a relative. So it's an extraordinary opportunity as a lawyer to be able to help people. And, and I enjoy it now because just as a lawyer in civilian practice, and, and I'm fortunate now that I can kind of pick and choose the cases that I, I really enjoy, and people come in and, and, and I can help them. And a lot of them are really, they don't know where to go. And, mm -hmm. and then they come to a lawyer and I said, listen, I spent an hour talking to them. My partner used to make fun of me. You're in there for an hour. But they come out of that initial consultation feeling like, holy cow, now at least I know. I may be in trouble, I may have economic things, but at least now I know the path that Martin's mm -hmm. explained to me. And I see the light, if you will. And you're doing tunnel. criminal defense now. So I do criminal defense. I, I do some domestic because I'm good at it, but it, um, not so much. And then just different contractual things, land right. disputes, anything sure. that comes in, um, guardianships for some minor children with their, their father just died. Um, and it really helps people. Yeah, it and does. that's what I really enjoy. Yeah, because when you get in a pickle like that and you don't know where to go or what to do and you're facing this mountain of legal ease, yep. you know, and it's, it's great overwhelming, to have somebody that, yeah, it's yeah. overwhelming. It's great to have somebody that can interpret that and say, hey, well, you know, this is what, this is what you should do. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. Um, and and that, that's a great stress relief for people, you know, and uh, it's a valuable service that, that you provide uh, for folks. And then, you know, think about, you know, you're charged with a crime and, you know, your future is, you know, got a big question mark on it, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, you got a couple options that, you know, you can go in and try to take a stand for yourself or you can have somebody advocate for you, which it's, you know, better to have somebody that knows what they're doing to right. advocate before you. And, and going you. back to some things, you know, some things deserve, you work it out and, and maybe even the charge gets dismissed or reduced. Yeah. And then you could even get it expunged in a lot of cases, yeah. even some prior convictions. Can hmm. we do that for Devin once we get that <laughs> monitor off? Yes, right. That particular whoa, class whoa, of whoa. felonies. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Sorry, Devin. <laughs> Sorry, Devin. Once again, 100 or 50 feet from the school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so that's great. So if you get something expunged, then it doesn't even appear. Yeah. yeah. And you never even have to answer. So were you charged with a crime? You can say no, because it's been expunged. Mm. Yeah. It was either dismissed, found not guilty, or it's uh, even some, some drug offenses can be yeah. expunged. Wow. So. Yeah. Interesting. So looking back on your, your journey from, you know, joining the Air Force to going into the reserves, being a, a pilot and and getting your law degree and just, you know, in the process of all this, what advice would you give to other veterans and 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 maybe even to those young people that are thinking about joining the service, right? What what kind of advice would you would you give to people that would, would maybe help them in, in their career path? Well, I think the biggest misconception, people think, oh, I don't want to join the military. I don't want people telling me what to do. Yeah. It's no different than any other job. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I finally joined the military, after my brother had my friends, my mom was like, whew, because I was not on a great path. And so the military provided me the structure, the discipline mm -hmm. to, to do well in life. Everything I've done, in the, I can really attribute the military mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. providing that guidance and that discipline that helped me succeed. Because uh, I never, like I said, I never planned on going to college a day. So it ended up graduating from law school. My mom came down. She, she was like, holy cow. I mean, none of us had gone to college initially. So One of the great benefits is you never have to think about your wardrobe. Yeah, that's yeah, right. You're See, I, I thought he was yeah. going to say if, if you're day. thinking about joining the military and you don't want people to tell you what to do, just become a warrant officer. Yeah, that's, well, true. That's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, you should become a warrant officer and just tell yourself what to do. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I did love that about the military. I mean, you, just, you don't have to think about, oh, yeah, I gotta, I, oh, I'm wearing green today. Okay, great. And tomorrow and, and the next day. And, you know, 
uh, the, the, so those simple things that the military does for you. Yeah. I remember, I remember um, just when I first joined, we were still shining boots. Right. And I remember that, you know, every night you, you would, you would sit down and you would put the TV on and you would, you would start to polish your boots because you had to have them, you know, spit shine in the morning at formation. And then they would just get destroyed through, throughout the day. <laughs> yeah. And then you get to just do that, repeat that process over and over. And there was something like cathartic about like polishing my boots and, <laughs> you know, ha, ha, right. And, and, and if on. you remember, you'd light the Kiwi uh, on fire. Yeah. Light yes. it on fire. And right? when I was in flight school and, you know, they inspected everything. So I lit it on fire and then I went to blow it out and I yeah. let it sit too long. <laughs> So there's too much liquid, and it blew all over my table. Oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah. I was like, oh, <laughs> my God. How am I going to clean this up? That's right. But, yeah. So when they went to those new boots, you know, where you didn't have to shine anymore, I was like, holy cow. Yeah, it was. Well, and the, uh, there's a certain part of me that longs for shining <laughs> boots again, right? It's the weird, yeah. sadistic part of me. I'll bring my shoes over. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. As long as they're Cochrane Field boots, I'll, I'll shine them for you. I know how to do that. So yeah. that's awesome. Well, Martin, it's, it's really been great having you on the show and, uh, you know, just want to encourage the, uh, the listeners to, uh, to check you out. You know, as we always tell folks, uh, don't just tell a, a veteran, thank you for your service, but really get in, ask some questions, you know, be, be inquisitive about their service. They got so many great stories that they can share and, and, you know, just be able to give you some insight as to, uh, what life in the military is like and what that transition period's like and, uh, from that, you know, we we just want to see the community be able to come together and be supportive. And I'm I'm really thrilled that you're you're aware of the Veterans Treatment Court. And as mm -hmm. Brad said, training's getting ready to start. I know they were taking some applications, Brad, for some of the positions. Have they all been filled? Well, there's or? only one position. It's it's the okay. uh, Treatment Court Coordinator. And they uh, last I talked to the DA's office, and they had interviewed some people, and so they really. Um, that position, you know, will need to be filled uh, in short order because Just that's a great kind of, opportunity to get yeah, involved. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't know if the job is still posted, but if anybody's interested and it's listening out there, that that might be a good career path for them where you get to help others and you get to work with a bunch of interesting folks. And, and they're signing up for the nonprofit partners to, to agree to help support some of the wraparound services. That's yes? correct. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that going on too. So uh, it's going to be really good. More to follow on that. We'll probably have... Uh, Probably have the DA on the show to talk about that in the next the uh, next few weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the mentors. Well, yeah. well, Brad, you're uh, you're going to get another day off. Am I? Oh no, no, you're not getting a day off. I'm on the road, so you're getting a day without me. So I won't be back <laughs> on the show week. next oh, Tuesday. I'll be man. in I'll be in Raleigh giving a, a presentation for the report for our our state funding that they gave us uh, this last year and the okay. uh, nearly 100 vets that we've helped with. Yeah, that's uh, pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Incredible. It really is. Maybe you can uh, make sure they're all working down there when you go. Uh, you know what? I don't think that ever happens. <laughs> <laughs> don't matter what I say. It's like, hey, I'm here to hold you guys accountable. Uh, I think so. it's the other way. I'm showing up so that they can hold us accountable. There you go. Yeah. There yeah. you go. So yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing everybody back. And Martin, thank you for being here today. Thanks God so bless you. For thank having you for me. your service. Enjoyed it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's been How great. How can people contact you, Martin, real quick as we close? So I, my law practice is just called God Home Law. I'm right down mm -hmm. on Kelly Street. Sounds good. Check them out. Yeah. We'll see y'all next week. week. You've been listening to Putting the Pieces Back Together with John Galena and Brad Borders. Join us again next Tuesday at 8 a.m. and Saturday at 5 p.m. for Putting the Pieces Back Together on News Talk WSIC.